So I do resource economics. Resource economics looks at natural resources and the environment and uh, space economics is just the extension of, to me, just the extension of resource economics into a different environment. We simply leave Earth and we move on to, uh, move into orbit, move up beyond that. You can illustrate almost everything that is really important and interesting in economics with space examples and it fits really well. So we can talk about economies of scale, we can talk about regulation, we can talk about uh, what is called the common pool problem and about how property rights might be a solution for that. And so those are the kinds of things we talked about in my, in my space course. I think I first became interested in space just from reading Robert Heinlein as an under, undergraduate, but I never thought, I wasn't an economist at the time, I was actually studying history. Heinlein talks about the future of man in space, the future of humanity in space, and I enjoyed uh, things like Star Trek and, and, and such. But I became interested after becoming an economist in the economics of space because it is a, it's a frontier, it's really a future. Uh, uh, for, for humanity. In space, we have everything we need in order to survive, just about everything we can imagine. Uh, on the moon, for example, there are sources of water. Water is essential, but you can convert water into oxygen or hydrogen. Once you've done that, you can breathe and you have rocket fuel, so you can travel. And the same thing goes for Mars. There seems to be substantial water ice on both Moon and Mars, and that's essential for travel, uh, for space colonization. Now you might ask, okay, but why, why would we even want to go there in the first place? And there are a number of interesting arguments, um, but let's start out with some economic ones. One is that we have almost unlimited minerals, uh, metals and things like this. Frankly, uh, there's so much stuff up there that material scarcity just becomes uh, uh, almost irrelevant at that point. Um, the real problem in accessing these is getting out of Earth's gravity well because it's very expensive to move from the Earth's surface to get into space. Once you're in space, travel is pretty cheap uh, because you don't have, have to worry about the effects of overcoming gravity. What's interesting about this is that when NASA was sending up, for example, the space shuttle, it cost $65,000 to put one kilogram, 2.2 pounds of material into orbit. Elon Musk has gotten that down below $1,000 a kilogram. Enormous savings. And the goal that Musk and others have set is they want to be the first to get it below $100 a kilogram. Once you can do that, it becomes inexpensive to get into space and you can begin doing real commercial development. One thing to remember about resources is that there is no such thing until there are human beings. Robert Zubrin has made this argument. Robert Zubrin, I should mention, is an engineer who has, uh, he's the guy who actually designed the Mars Direct program that Elon Musk is interested in and for colonizing Mars. But Robert Zubrin has observed that there are no resources on Mars. There's stuff on Mars. There's material on Mars. There's no resources until humans get there and apply intellect and knowledge in order to convert it to our purposes. And then you have resources. When NASA first began with the Moon program, that was a government program and governments can be pretty good at setting a target goal and then organizing behavior around that, organizing um, activity around that. So for example, landing on the moon. Here's what we need to do to land on the moon. These are the steps and they plan this out. But doing it in a cost-effective manner, economically sustainable manner is what government is not good at doing. That requires the entrepreneurial mindset and it requires competition in the marketplace. And so the, for economic expansion into space, it really required shifting the way that space is financed. Originally, it was done on a government cost plus contracting basis, just the way that military procurement is, where someone gets a contract and they say, we'll pay you your costs plus a, a certain amount on top of that. 
And so there's no incentive to control cost and there's no competition to speak of. The way NASA now operates and the way much space development occurs, not just in the United States but elsewhere, is that someone who wants to do something in space, including NASA, will say, here's what we want to do, and various entrepreneurs will give them bids on it and they take the best deal. And so it is a very, it becomes a very competitive kind of market with entrepreneurs trying to find cheaper ways to get into space and do things. And that has made all the difference. People, I think, don't recognize also how today how important space activity is, space economic activity. Uh, so for example, the GPS system. Everyone uses a GPS system in, in one way or another. If you use a cell phone, you're using the GPS system. If you go to an American bank, you're using the GPS system because the American financial system utilizes the CCM clocks on the GPS satellites for timing of transactions to keep track of what time different transaction, transactions come in and they can time these things to a split second. And so the GPS system is, is a major contributor to our financial system. We have satellite systems that are used, of course, for communication, but also for all kinds of remote sensing. So it's used for insurance adjustment, it's used for farming, it's used for uh, uh, GPS, of course, is used now for contour plowing and for uh, application of herbicides and insecticides, spot application. You find out just the spot on your field that needs, needs the application instead of hitting the whole field. So it's made agriculture much more, much less costly. It's very efficient. You know, there's one other thing. We've been talking about the economics of space development and economic rationales for it. But some have argued that there's another reason to go to space. And I think maybe this is fundamental and needs not to be forgotten. And that is that human beings are oriented towards exploration and towards building and achieving. And we've done so much on Earth, we need some new challenge. And today we often see people who are thinking, you know, there are too many people on Earth and life is awful and we're doomed and this sort of thing. And in fact, we've got so much potential in space. Some of us have argued is that the real thing about developing space is that it's a spiritual challenge. It really is a vision that humans are animals that do exploration. And this is our destiny to go into space. And if we are, if we really want to pursue that, that's our future. That that's what really drives me to space. It's the, it's the challenge and the fascination of it.